Yeah, so the title for my presentation that I've chosen is Natural Language Interface. Uh, it's not the most common one, it's my favorite way to call this thing, but uh, the terms that you might have heard instead are conversational interfaces, personal assistance, well, bots are also kind of, or can be kind of natural language interfaces, or dialogue systems. So just already from the beginning, I want to make sure it's these things that I aim to speak about. And who am I? Uh, well, my name is, thank you, Peter, uh, Sonja Petrovic Lundberg, and I am research engineer at Artificial Solutions, uh, a company uh, behind Taneo, which is a development environment, a platform for developing natural language interfaces. And this is something I'm really passionate about, which I guess will be clear very soon. I also have background in computational linguistics, different kind of computational linguistics, not only dialogue systems, mathematics, and entrepreneurship. So what do I mean when I say natural language interface? Well, the first two letters, the NL, the natural language, it is the human language. It is the language that I speak to you now, that people speak with each other in person, or on phone, or when texting, messaging, writing or reading any kind of uh, written text. And I also considered sign language and sometimes simplified gesture language to be also kind of natural language. So natural language is the human language. It's how we people communicate with each other. And as such, it has evolved for as long as life on Earth has evolved, right? right? It's millions of years of evolution that have brought us here today and that have created the language that we use to be as it is. And it is very advanced. It is the most advanced way of communication that we have on Earth today. And it is efficient, and it is universal. All people, or as, as good as all people, use it. And it is unrestricted, unrestricted. So even if sometimes it is difficult to put emotions into words, uh, as I guess we've all experienced at one point or another, at least uh, human language is highly fitted for expressing our thoughts. There are even psychologists and research that tries to say that we can't think without language. So thinking, we, we, are, we can only form thoughts that we have a language for, that we can express in language. So what we can think of we can express using natural language. But then, uh, when I say interface, what do I mean by that? And we've heard, had many nice presentations, several nice presentations here about different kinds of interfaces. Uh, when, I, when I use this word, I mean something very general. So I mean the layer uh, between us, humans, and technology. So okay, natural language in general is what people use uh, for communicating with each other, and interface is something which is between us and technology. So it is something that helps, helps us communicate with technology, with machines. So then what does it mean when we say that natural language is interface? Uh, that's one, what I want to look into. So, I'll start by a concrete example. Uh, when preparing for this presentation, I was actually at some point of time in time wondering what other presentations are happening at the same time at this conference. And if Internet Dogana had a natural language interface, then yeah, I could use natural language to acquire this information. So I could just go to this interface, whatever it is, and ask what presentations are kept happening at Internet Dogana right now. And then I would get an answer that would look something like this. These are the presentations, and I believe there are 10 of them happening right now in 10 tracks. But the fact is, there is no natural language interface for Internet Dogana. Uh, so what is the alternative? If you don't have natural language interface to speak with technology as we speak with each other, how do I acquire this information? Well, the best way I found, I don't know about you, was uh, the 
conference website. So this, I went to this main page. Then I clicked on program, which brought me here. Then I had to scroll all the way down to different tracks. Then I picked the first track, which brought me here. Then scroll down again to this time slot, see what the presentation is about. Go back, scroll down, pick next track, scroll, uh, scroll down to the same time slot. You get the point. Well, this not only took me several minutes um, or longer, uh, also by the time I reached maybe fifth presentation or fifth track, I already forgot what the first one was about. And I'm not saying that uh, the Internet Agana website is a bad one. Actually, it was very clear and intuitive, and at least I didn't need to find the, I mean, it was very clear from the very beginning where I should click uh, to begin with. Uh, so what other interfaces are there? As, as I defined uh, just a minute ago, interfaces, how we uh, interact with technology, the layer between us and technology. And the fact is that early technology didn't need much of interface. There was not much one could do and not much to understand or misunderstand. So there was a button to push or something to pull like this. But uh, after a century or two, what we've got of our first computers, right? And these computers, what could they understand? Well, they could understand, again, being turned on and off or zeros and ones. And this is the language that the early programmers on this picture had to use. So they ha in order to communicate with the, the early computers, the interface they had was this, zeros and ones. Not so easy, right? Not so intuitive. Required a lot of training, a lot of thought, very error prone. Luckily, as we know, evolution hasn't stopped there. And today's programming languages, high-level programming languages, are mu much easier to use. And I'm eternally grateful for this. Uh, I have an aunt who's become a programmer in the 50s. And hearing her speak about the reality of programming with first cards and then uh, tapes, etc., <laughs> uh, yeah, makes me extra grateful to be born now. But uh, has the evolution uh, moved towards simpler and easier to use in most areas? Unfortunately, it hasn't. At least for me, this old model of microwave interface is uh, quite a bit clearer than a modern one. Uh, also, I dare say, all old microwaves had the same kind of uh, uh, control, while new microwaves have different features and different interfaces, not to speak about phones, right? You couldn't do much using uh, an old telephone where you could make conversations, and you can do a lot with modern telephones, but you also need to learn quite a complex UI. As we've heard during the second keynote, I believe, this morning, uh, it's, it's not only that you need to use to learn the interface of your phone, you need to learn the interface of each and every app on your phone. And even though apps were popular and nice and fun and gave a, a feeling of freedom and choice, people are not installing apps any longer, right? What, does, what was the stats that most users were using one to eight apps that they already have on their phone and not, um, and, and not installing new ones? So this, this is for which, uh, what for me makes natural language interfaces so revolutionary and so important and exciting. For the first time ever, it is the technology that is learning the language of the humans. It's technology learning our language and not we learning the language of technology, which is different for every single device. And as such, uh, our human language is, it is the same language. It doesn't matter which device I'm using or app or program, it is the same language that I use, the same language that I use when speaking with you. And not only is this uh, uh, cool and practical, 
it is also democratic and inclusive because it lowers the barrier. And I mentioned my aunt programmer. Well, she had to spend and invest quite some time learning how to program in, uh, in 40s and 50s in Yugoslavia, and that was, uh, that was a luxury. Uh, if people can interact with technology using only their everyday language, then the thresholds are lower. Okay? Uh, and this is all nice and good in theory, but we've had a couple of uh, uh, bot presentations right before me, and I think Fredrik brought up excellent examples of natural language interfaces not really measuring up, not really uh, getting the whole, uh, reaching the whole way. So I wonder how many of you uh, have used at least one of these natural language interfaces. So either Amazon Alexa, Windows Cortana, iPhone Siri, Google Now. How many have used more than one? Not that many, so I don't know about you, but I'd kind of interpret that as that using the first one didn't inspire too much to try the second. Still, most of you raised your hands, and you are not the only ones. The most recent statistics I could find say that 70%, more than 70% of 20, 18 to 29-year-olds in the US, and almost 60% of 30 to 43-year-olds use personal assistance regularly. Good or bad, uh, uh, they, they are used. Also, since uh, 2015, an important switch happened, uh, talking about mobility and connected devices and so on. So since last year, more than half of all Google searches are done using mobile devices and not using desktop. And of those searches, more than 20% are done using voice and uh, kind of the trend is pointing straight up. And it's not only young and um, youngish people who like personal assistance. For example, in the US, where uh, Amazon's high speaker, uh, uh, yeah, a loudspeaker echo that I showed on the first uh, on the previous slide was launched together with the personal assistant Alexa, it was actually very appreciated by elderly and young children in families that acquired uh, Echo and Alexa. And one of the things that uh, uh, I think is most encouraging in this field is that all the major software companies are heavily investing into this. They are struggling to provide the best user interfaces both for the users of the natural language interfaces and for the bot developers. So the struggle, the, the, the market, uh, how to say, uh, the, the, um, the struggle for a bigger piece of market is happening on both uh, fields, both the user field, let's, uh, we want as many as possible users to use our personal assistance, but also we want as many as possible developers to develop bots for our uh, channel, our natural language interface. And this is good, right? At least in some areas, competition drives create creativity. So, ever, so however good or bad uh, natural language interfaces are, they are here to stay. I did there uh, claim that. Then let's go at how good they are. Well, the marketing in this field uh, my impression is that it will have us believe that, uh, well, natural language interaction is just another kind of artificial intelligence. So it is the matter of feed the data, uh, let it learn, and then out on the other side with barely uh, any involvement from human developers will come out a personal assistant, all capable and ready to serve you. Sounds great, right? Uh, but is it true? Well, I think 
Friedrich demonstrated really nicely. Not really, or not yet. Why isn't, is it not true? So all these major players are heavily investing in natural language interaction, in building these interfaces. So why is it so hard? I mean, children learn to speak by the time they're two, right? So if a two-year-old can learn to interact using human language, why can't uh, supercomputers? Well, the first reason are the human uh, is the human language or languages themselves, right? Only because uh, I can communicate in English doesn't, doesn't mean that I can do that in Chinese. There are 6,000 languages out there. Then, the same things that make human language efficient and, and uh, powerful for us humans make it hard, implicit, implicit, vague, ambiguous for, uh, for computers. Because when speaking, we, we rely on shared common knowledge that we refer to, that both you and I have, and that helps us understand the meaning of the words. Humans, uh, computers do not uh, gain this knowledge in the same way that we humans do. So, for example, this simple sentence, I saw a man on a hill with a telescope. It seems obvious, but when you th really think about it, then there are at least five interpretations of what it actually means. And the correct interpretation is based on, based on the context. So probably if we ever talked about this and one of us used this sentence, we'll know what it means. But how would computer do that? Then, again, as I, as I said at the beginning, human language is unlimited. And this is great. This is what makes it so attractive. You can express anything you can think of using human language, but it, also, it is also hard to support. In a graphical user interface, you only need to support things that are there. User can't push button that, it's, that is not there, uh, but you can never foresee or limit what the user would say. So I don't know if you noticed, I did, when Friedrich and Sanna demonstrated different bots, then they really smartly avoided this problem by um, offering buttons as uh, answer alternatives to some questions. And this felt like natural language, right? But you could only click yes or no. So the system didn't need to deal with the maybe or uh, Yeah, so natural language interfaces need to at least understand both things they can do and they can't. And then, of course, uh, again, same words can have different meanings and different words, same meaning. So all is good means more or less the same as everything is fine, but fine in the second sentence has very little in common with fine in the third. I got a parking fine today. Last but not the least, languages, natural languages are constantly evolving, which means that natural language interfaces also have to. Challenge number two, modality. As I said, natural language comes in many different formats, and uh, an ideal natural language interface should support them all. So already the simplest format to parse, to understand text, is not as trivial as it might seem. So, for example, just splitting a sentence into words is a um, challenge, is a demanding task in some languages, like Japanese. Voice has um, for a long time been a bottleneck, a boundary, but only during the last couple of years, amazing development has happened. So, as late as this year, we start getting reports of automatic speech recognition companies achieving human performance. So having automated systems that can interpret voice as well, so convert voice to text as well as human, as we humans can. Unfortunately, when it comes to sign language recognition and other video recognition, there is still uh, some way to go, but the image general image recognition and image analysis uh, development is encouraging. So I hope we'll see a lot, of, lot happening in this area.
in the coming, in the coming uh, years. Challenge number three is context, and context can mean many different things. So it can depend on where we are seeing something, like referring to shoes on this page in my web browser, or saying go to the right if you are walking in on the street or something like that, and also referring to something we've said previously. Like here, his shoes refers to John, and that reference can stretch several sentences back. So interpretation of a single utterance depends very much on the context of that utterance. Then it also depends, as I said, on world knowledge. Any Swede would know what this means. I mean, book me a morning train to IKEA's headquarters, and you know where IKEA's quarters are. But for a system natural language interface to support this, it's not enough that it understands the a sentence. It also needs to know, well, what, what are morning hours in this culture, and where is IKEA, IKEA located? Then we have the time and place and topic context. So we have uh, um, two pairs of same expressions, Friday at 9, in both these sentences in Indian, but they may mean really different things. So if you say book a dinner on Friday at 9, it means coming Friday, and it means 9 p.m. And if you say bring notes from meeting on Friday at 9, then it is previous Friday, right? because the meaning has already happened, and probably 9 a.m. And in Indian above means uh, restaurant, while below can mean embassy, client, company, but most probably not restaurant. And nearest requires knowledge of uh, the user's current GPS location. Then, uh, I just claimed that natural language is universal, that you use same language, you would use same language with all devices. You, you wouldn't need to learn each app's UI. But the fact is that the response has to be device dependent, because you can't give same kind of response to a person who's using desktop computer with a lot of uh, screen space, and the person who's driving their car and speaking, even though they are asking same question. And personalization. Uh, one thing that we who are working with natural language interfaces notice is that the more human like an interface is, the more human like behavior you users expect. Frederick has also been into this. So you noticed that you yourself said thank you and please and so on when speaking with the bot. Because it did seem human in its answers. And it, I mean, what do you expect from a personal assistant if it was a real person? Well, you expect the, the assistant to know you, to know things. I mean, to rem remember your previous conversations, to know your <coughs> family members, sorry, uh, about your family members, and uh, maybe credit card information, address, whatever. And this requires, uh, just imagine when you, you think how to implement this, it requires uh, authentication, voice-based, uh, login-based, whatever, and it also requires user, uh, some storing the information in some user model. Uh, then uh, there are some kinds of requests which are more difficult to uh, support than the others. I won't go into details, but uh, I'd say there are very few uh, personal assistants, dialogue systems, conversational interfaces out there that can do this that can answer uh, requests that handle requests that consist of multiple tasks, like scheduling and uh, texting, or that can understand negation. So all Asian restaurants, but not Chinese, or like here, long jackets with zipper, but without hood and not red. There are not many that can do this. And also, just imagine what kind of processing is needed for this last sentence. The sentence itself is not hard. Which countries' capitals have more snow in November than Sweden? But it requires such amount of world knowledge, knowing what is the capital of Sweden, which are the other capitals, how many snow is all of these, and then comparisons, cross-references of these results, and then, not the least, advanced answer generation, compiling all this information into a nice uh, user-friendly format and not returning 2,187 <laughs> possible destinations or flights, as we've seen <coughs> in an example before. 
one more thing with uh, uh, human-like uh, behavior is that you want uh, your interface to be able to resolve ambiguities. Like if you say um, book a meeting at nine, the interface might ask, do you mean AM or PM? Or also recovery, either if a misunderstanding has happened or if the user changes their mind. Also, if we have a human-like na uh, natural language interface, then it, it is not only answering to your requests, it's also taking initiative. So for example, if you've just booked a ticket to uh, Stockholm, you might receive an answer, oh, here is your uh, ticket, and by the way, it's gonna snow, so make sure to pack your warm jacket or good boots, right? That's what a real human personal assistant would do for you. And the same about small talk. A human-like uh, interface, and now we are moving beyond ordinary natural language understanding, would on, on, not only be able to answer questions like, how are you today, or what's your favorite color, but also ask them. Eliza could do kind of this, so why wouldn't modern natural language interfaces? And the last is persistency. So this is a challenge. I mean, we are saying that we have same interface across all devices, well then we do want to carry on conversations ac across devices, right? If it is the same interface, then why wouldn't I expect my fridge, <laughs> well maybe not fridge, but my computer when I arrive at home to ask me, oh do you want to finish the booking you started in your car? Okay, these are the challenges, these are the things that are hard. How do we, do we we overcome them. How do we build natural language interfaces of today? We've, se we've seen example of really simple interfaces like the bots, the bot that Sana has built, or examples uh, of, uh, of, my, of the Twitter bots and Fred Fredericks as well. And they are, these are all good use cases. But I think you'll agree with me that they are limited. I mean, the, the art behind those use cases is finding what is simple enough, what is doable and still useful, and that's great. But if we are aiming at the kind of ubiquitous and over uh, a human-like behavior, how do we do that? And I think, because I don't have that much time left, I'll focus just on two or, or five steps that I have prepared. And the first is the step that most marketing is focused on. So we want to collect all kinds of data about what our uh, natural language interface should do. So. Uh, if we have a lot of data, if we have natural language interactions that our system can learn from, then we apply machine learning and we've come quite a long way. But in my experience, this is a rare luxury. Usually there is not much data to start from. Maybe if it, we were building Internet Dagana natural language interface, we would have the website to start with. We could extract answers from there. But the questions we need to think of and model ourselves, at least in the first iteration. Then we want to build natural language interaction models, either learn from data and so on. One important thing here is that we want to have the full control of the natural language interaction models. We can't let, for example, machine learning lose. I don't know if you've heard about Microsoft's Twitter bot, Tai, that was published as a teenage girl personality and was supposed to learn, expand its language from its users. And by the end of the day, it turned into a white middle-aged man racist, according to its knowledge. You don't want this to happen in your natural language interface. So whatever it's learning, you want to have control. This is how a natural language interaction model can look like. Then, of course, customizing and fine-tuning, as I already said. Even though the inputs are the same, they come in natural language in independently of modality and context, still your answers, your responses should be different if on a TV screen or car or smartwatch. Deploying and hosting, not a really sexy topic, but uh, remember the keynote uh, that we heard uh, right after lunch, security. Uh, an important one, an important topic. You want to think about data protection when, <coughs> when, when you implement 
natural language interfaces. And then the most important thing is, once you have your system, your interface up and running, now is when the, uh, when the, 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 the exciting things happen, because now you start to gather the interaction data. Now you can see what are your users interested in? What, what, what answers do they want to have? How are they expressing? So you can improve the answers that you're given, you can improve language understanding, you can personalize the behavior, you can implement or learn proactive behavior from all those interactions, uh, uh, add new languages, etc., etc., and also gain unique insights about your users. Because again, in all other interfaces, your users are limited by what they can do. If you have a natural language interface, you can discover what they really want to do, even if they can't. And this can be used for good things and bad things. It's up to you. But it is an opportunity. OK. And this is my very last slide. Uh, so if you want to go out and try and uh, maybe go a little bit beyond what we've already seen with, with bots, and you are either an individual or a small company or just a developer experimenting, then you can try some free APIs out there. I've only listed the biggest ones or the ones with biggest, how to say, companies behind them. There are others. Uh, there are others, but this might be worth exploring so they can help you build natural language interactions. And they all have some advantages and some disadvantages. Uh, or uh, if you are a larger company, an enterprise, then probably what you're interested in, in is a end-to-end, E2E solution that covers all the five steps that I've just gone through. And also you want something that's um, developed for, for enterprises, including security, including scalability. And in that case, they are not. Uh, then, of course, I'd recommend the platform that I myself <laughs> have helped develop, and it is Teneo by Artificial Solutions. And that's it. Uh, well, thanks a lot for listening, and uh, good luck either uh, developing or using natural language interfaces of the future. <laughs>